Good morning, everybody. Great to see you on this beautifully sunny Sunday morning. I don't know if you are anything like me. When I get up in the morning and I see the sun, I get happy. Hands up if you're like me. Do you get happy? Yes, yes, amazing. Okay, John is giving me evil eyes because he's from Canada, so he's more used to the snow and to the rain and to the cold. But we are all not like you, John. So turn the air conditioning down in the office. That's exactly what I'm t I've been telling him all week. But hey, it's so great to see you. And if this is your first time here, we want to say a very special welcome to you. You are our VIP guest, and we want to make sure we make you feel extra special. So why don't you head out to our new guest lounge at the end of our gathering. You'll find it outside those auditorium doors onto your right-hand side. And there's a team of people there who'd love to connect with you, give you some tea and coffee, just chat with you and get to know you better. So do head over there at the end of our time in here. Now, I also want to say a very special welcome to everyone joining us from across the world online. We love that you can tune in. Welcome. We're so glad to have you as well. Well, we're going to be here for about 75 minutes in total and we've got our wonderful team they're going to lead us in a few songs in just a few minutes the words are going to come up on the screen so you can follow along super easily but right now why don't you stand up on your feet say hello to a few people around you and ask them are you glad summer's on the way well i hope you're ready to sing we're going to celebrate his goodness for he is a good god let it be on the screen. I want you to sing together with us. When I think about your goodness, my heart is overcome. Come on. How can I begin to thank you for everything you've done? And you keep on loving me. And you cause my heart to sing. Celebrate 
Savior. We have the privilege to be called children of God. Amen. Come on. As we sing this song, I sing with confidence that our, that our identity is in Christ. Who am I that the highest king would welcome you? I was lost, but he brought me in all his love for You are for 
breaks, but because you have loved us since the beginning. Thank you, Lord. Can't go back to the beginning. I can't control what tomorrow will bring. But I know here in the middle is the place where you promised to be. Not enough unless you come. Will you meet me here again? Cause all I want is all you are. Will you meet me here again? Oh Lord, we need you every hour. I walk through the valley. As I walk now through the valley, let your love rise above everything. Like the sun shaping the shadow in my weakness, your
Yes, you come. Will you meet me here again? Cause all I want is all you are. Will you meet me here again? Oh. Father, we lift our eyes to you this morning. And I pray that you hear the cry of our hearts. All we want is all that you are. All we want this morning, God, is everything that you are because we know that your presence is enough. Your presence changes everything. The Lord is in this place. Do you believe that this morning, church, that the Lord is in this place, that He is in our midst? The Bible says that the Lord inhabits the praises of His people. As we lift up our eyes to Him, as we lift up our hearts, as we lift up our worship, the presence of God comes and it inhabits our praises. The Lord is in this place, but He is also in your place. Whatever situation challenges you right now, whatever trial, whatever obstacle, wherever you find yourself this morning, the Lord is in your place. Deuteronomy 31, it says that you can be strong and you can be courageous. You don't have to be afraid. You don't have to be terrified. The Lord your God goes with you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. And that's for you with your family. It's for you in your finances. It's for you in your workplace, in your neighborhoods, in your societies. The Lord is in this place. Come on, why don't we sing that again? Come on, church, let's sing it with faith this morning. you this morning, wherever you find yourself, whatever your situation looks like, whatever your circumstance is, the word of the Lord to you this morning is that He is with you. That's the truth of the Bible. That's what the word of God says. He's with you. He will never leave you. He will never forsake you. You are never alone. The presence of our living and our loving God is with you both now and forevermore. Can you say amen with me, church? Amen. amen. Amazing. Yeah. Let's lift him up one more time. Amazing. I'm going to invite you to take your seats where you are. It's so good to come and worship together, to come with other believers and with people from all nations, to come and just to lift up the name of God, to lift up our glorious God, because he is worthy of all of our praise and all of our adoration. Amen. Fantastic. Well, hey, listen, if you thought that was good, if you enjoyed that, we're only just getting started. Today, we're kicking off a brand new series called At The Movies, and our very own senior pastor, Pastor Daniel Indrajaya, yes, he is on fire this morning, and um, he's going to be kicking off this series, and he's going to be basing his message this morning on the beautiful movie that I have actually never seen called Jurassic World. Anybody else seen Jurassic World? Okay, everybody, just me then, cool. Well, he's doing a fantastic job. The nine o'clock gathering was amazing. So can I encourage you to lean in to make sure that you take hold everything that he has to say to us because this is a fun series and this message is fun, but it's also really profound. And so I wanna encourage you to take hold of that and to lean in this morning. Well, alongside that, you may have also noticed 
that uh, we ran a little social media competition over the last few days. And so we asked you to send us your best impersonations of a T-Rex dinosaur. And let me tell you, there were some doozies. But we have picked the best one of all, and I am so proud to announce that the winner of our T-Rex impersonation challenge is... Janine Oost, yes! And this was her submission, look at that. <laughs> yeah, come on, come on up, Janine. These are your free movie tickets. You can enjoy that. Who are you going to take with you to the movies, Janine? <laughs> this right here. Mwah. This is the wonderful Janine. Yes, or we can call her Mrs. T-Rex from now on. Whichever one works. So Janine, enjoy your prize. It's two tickets to the movies. And hey, listen, if you didn't win this time, don't you worry. Keep your eyes peeled on social media. There's going to be lots more competitions coming up. And you might walk away with two free tickets to the movies. You never know. Amazing. Well, I want to talk to us um, a little bit about something that we referenced last week. Now, um, you, many of you may have seen, or many of you may have heard on the news, just the amount of devastation that's happening in Palu, in the city um, in Indonesia. And um, last week, Pastor Daniel talked to us about you know, the earthquake that had hit Palu and 7.5 on the Richter scale, huge tragedy, and then a tsunami. And I was reading yesterday that 1,500 lives have been lost up to date. That's such a huge tragedy, a big devastation in the city of Palu. And, you know, as a church, Daniel talked to us last week, and he said, you know, when we see this, when we hear this, we can't stay silent. We need to do something. We have to be moved to action. We may not be able to do everything, but we can do something. And so we decided that as we came to our giving last week, that anything that we collected in our offering across both our morning gatherings, we were going to take every cent and we were going to send it to Palu so that we can bless and help the relief efforts taking place in Palu, Indonesia. And um, I'm so happy to announce that in the two morning services last week, we raised a grand total of $8,739. Yeah, that is worthy of celebration. Isn't that amazing? That's fantastic. That's just in one morning. And that's just you and I, us being a generous church, knowing that we're called to be a blessing, not just here, but also to our brothers and sisters overseas. So thank you so much to everybody who gave so generally, generously. We're so blessed by you. And we know that this money is going to help so many people rebuild their lives in Palu and in Indonesia as well. Well, we're all not only a generous church overseas, but I know that this community is so generous and so faithful in giving week in and week out right here at home so that we can create spaces just like these so that people can come and encounter the love and the grace of God that you and I have both encountered. So we're going to come to our giving right now. And if this is your first time here, please, I want to stress this, you are under no obligation at all to give. You know, this is our gift to you. We just want you to sit back, relax, and just enjoy our gathering. But for us here who call ourselves church family, we consider it a joy and a privilege to be able to give to our God. So there's a few ways that you can do that today. And if you haven't planned your giving, that's all right. We got you covered. You can go online to the rocks.info and use the giving tab and give that way. Or you can use the envelopes that you would have found on your seat as you came in. Our wonderful host team are going to release the buckets, and you can just put your giving in the buckets in just a moment. Fantastic. Well, while we're doing that and the buckets are coming around, thank you, host team. We're going to find out about everything that's coming up in the life of our church, and we've got a very special guest who's going to tell us everything that we need to know. Hey everyone, welcome to Jurassic World. My name is Ranger John and it is my pleasure to be your tour guide here this morning. Before we get to the main attraction, it's my pleasure to let you and your family know what's going around this island. So check this out. If you are joining us for the first time here today, we are thrilled to have you be with us this morning. Please keep on the path at all times and keep lookout for any small creatures on the road. After the tour, we would love to personally meet you in our new guest lounge in the foyer. There are some people there who would love to chat with you over a free coffee. And we also have a small gift for you to take home from the gift shop. So be sure to stop by and say hello. 
Shh, shh, keep quiet. You see that summit over there? That's called the Global Leadership Summit. GLS is perfect for all business or church leaders looking to take their career or ministry to the next level by watching video casts of fresh, actionable and inspiring leadership content from world-class faculty. It's happening later this week on Thursday and Friday. Good thing you're here today because as a bonus on today's adventure at Jurassic World, you get the host rate of $99. You can sign up after today's tour at the Connection Desk or on the rocks.info. Our last stop on the tour is in the Great Plains yonder. You'll see a lot of young adults meeting here on Wednesday nights at 7 p.m. Young adults exist to build a community that is connected, loving, generous, and influential. We want to see 18 to 29 year olds get connected with one another and with God and who are influencing their world whether at university work or at home. This coming Wednesday is a YA gathering, so be sure to invite a mate at 7 for a 7.30 start. Well, that concludes this part of the tour today, but make sure you sit back, relax, and are firmly buckled in because the main attraction is coming up next. To keep in touch with everything happening around the rocks and Jurassic World, you can find updates in some of our winning stories on Facebook and Instagram by searching the handle at the rocks pair. If you have any questions about anything you've heard today, or you just want to find out more about what we do around here, stop by the Connection Desk or visit us online at therocks.church. Hello? Hi, everybody, and welcome. Excuse me. Woo. Gentlemen, do you know what time it is? It's time. Time for what? It's something big. Something so big. <laughs> Were you scared? Tell me honestly. Do you want to know what it is at the movies? What? At the movies. What's that? Very good movies. Movies? I haven't been to the movies in ages. Mm-mm. This is for church. At the movies. Church. Movies. Church. The movie. The church meeting. Movies. Inconceivable. We're a match made in heaven. Let's all go to the movie. Good morning, everybody. How's everybody doing this morning? So good to see you here. My name is Daniel Indrajaya. I'm one of the pastors here at church, and it is my privilege to welcome all of you here this morning. I want to add my personal welcome, especially if this is your first time coming to our church. You are a very, very special guest. As Sid has said earlier, our slogan around here is no perfect people allowed. We believe there's no one perfect, and we gather here every Sunday to celebrate God's grace, God's forgiveness in our lives, and we want to invite you to join in in this faith community, whoever you are, wherever you are in your spiritual journey. Maybe you're not even a Christian. It doesn't matter. You are welcome in this place. There will be no judgment whatsoever, and we just love the fact that you're here this morning, all right? I've been so looking forward to this series, you know, all months long, a few months we've been preparing for this, and today... I'm so excited to be starting it finally. And before we start with our first movie today, I want to talk about why we do this series first. Because I know as we do this series, some of you are thinking, uh, should we really do this? You know, should we really mix <laughs> movies with church? And some of you are thrilled that, you know, we are doing this. So I want to ask this age-old question. This is the struggle that Christians have been uh, having uh, all throughout centuries, you know, as a church, individually, corporately, we've been struggling with this issue, what do we do with the culture that we live in? So I want to answer this question, why we do this series, why we do this, because it's important for us to set the stage right, okay? I want to bring you back to 1951. In 1951, there's this great theologian and ethicist by the name of Richard Neighbor, who actually wrote a very important book called Christ and Culture. In this book, he outlined five different ways throughout history how Christians have been interacting with culture. And I want to just simplify it this morning and reduce it to three for the sake of time, all right? Here's the first one. Uh, some people uh, view culture as something bad, something evil, something sinful. 
This view is called Christ against culture. So people who believe in this view believe that they must make a radical break with the culture that they're in. That means no movies, no dancing, no drinking, no tattoos, no, you know, whatever, right? <laughs> Some of them don't even celebrate Christmas because they believe Jesus Christ was not born on December 25th. And they don't celebrate Easter because Easter is a pagan celebration. You know, they hate all this, you know, um, superfluous stuff that happens in our, in our world, in our culture that is not important. Some of them are even against the government. They don't you know, serve their country. They don't salute their flag because they believe culture, the culture that they live in is basically sinful and they must make a radical break from it, all right? Uh, the Amish, the Quakers, uh, the people who take this view to the most extreme possible where they detach themselves from the society. That's Christ against culture. The second way you can live your life as a Christian is by following this principle, Christ of culture. This view is the exact opposite of the first view. This view embraces culture. This view believes that culture is basically good. They downplay the fall of men, and they believe that, you know, as Christians, we just have to be part of the culture that we're, we're in. So they don't mind about tattoos, they don't mind about drinking, they don't mind about, you know, uh, whatever it is, profanity, whatever, because they believe we are part of the culture, and, and that's fine, all right? They downplay the, the fall of men a little bit, all right? There's a third view, though. You don't have to do either or, and I believe this third view is the most biblical and is the one that we should aspire to, to live by. It is Christ above culture. This view believes that culture has been tainted by sin, but this view also believes that God's grace is in culture. Uh, they believe that Jesus Christ came to our world to redeem the culture that we have. So you're not to separate yourself from the culture. You're not to become part of the culture, but you are there to redeem the culture that you're in. And I believe this is fantastic. I believe out of this room, I'm hoping, I'm praying that one of you will be the Prime Minister of Australia. One of you will be the great next singer uh, with your song being in the Billboard Top 10, you know, or even number one. I believe, you know, you need to be the best actor possible. If you, that's your skill, if that's your gifting, you need to redeem Hollywood. You, know, you need to go in all these places, be the best doctor you can be, be the best politician you can be, and be part of the culture around you, knowing that you carry God's light with you wherever you go. And this is exactly what Jesus says in John chapter 17. Jesus said this, I have given them your word and the world has hated them for they are not of the world any more than I'm of the world. Do you know that as a Christian, if you call yourself a Christian, you are not of this world just like Jesus was not of this world? Why? We are a new creation. We have been redeemed by Christ. My prayer is not that you take them out of the world. So we're not to be a hermit. We're not to be a monk living in a desert. Jesus says, no, that's not my prayer. It's not to take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. They are not of the world, even as I'm not of the world. Do you know, Christians, that you are in the world, but you are not of it? Yeah. Right? Salt is no good if it stays inside the salt shaker. Salt has to be out of the salt shaker for it to be useful. All right? So don't shy away from culture. Be part of it knowing that you carry God's light and God's blessing, God's grace with you. Okay? That's why I love to do these movies because guess what? Movies today is, is pre very much a, a big part of our culture. Do you know that every summer, people spend $4 billion to go and watch movies? Yeah? And, and movies are great. Because well-made movies, you know, uh, it's not just for entertainment, it's not just for escapism, you know, for fun, but well-made movie carries often deep, you know, meaningful, long-lasting truth. Through watching these movies, you can know about people's struggle. You know about their hopes and dreams and their challenges. That's why I'm so excited to be bringing you this series. And the first movie we're going to learn from is this awesome movie from one of the greatest movie franchises ever, The Jurassic World. Let's see the trailer. She's tracked. Okay, okay, come on. Okay. Ah. Are you okay? 
I'm okay. How many can you save? Eleven species. Blue is the last of her kind. You'll never capture her. We thought you might know someone who could help. A rescue op? What could go wrong? Hey, Blue. You know me. Come with me. You know you can't stay here. Back your men up right now. It was all a lie! The man who proved raptors can follow orders. You never thought how many millions a trained predator might be once? They're gonna sell them. Not blue. They need it for something else. What is that thing? They made it. This is the most dangerous creature that ever walked the earth. I say we shut this whole thing down. Hey, girl. You think what I'm thinking? Genetic power has now been unleashed. You can't put it back in the box. Make him back. Remember, you're the one who made me come here. I'll be all right. These creatures were here before us. And if we're not careful, they're going to be here after. Welcome to Jurassic World. It is such a fun movie. Um, do you know that the very first movie, Jurassic World uh, Fallen Kingdom, is actually the fifth movie in the Jurassic franchise? Do you know that? That the first movie of this franchise, Jurassic Park, actually was released in 1993. That was like 25 years ago. How many of you, I want to see a show of hands, how many of you actually watched the first Jurassic Park movie in 1993. Man, you're old. You're old. I was not even born yet, you know. <laughs> well, through, <laughs> throughout this movie franchise, the plot is actually very simple. It's about people recreating this dinosaur through genetic manipulation and put these dinosaurs in this theme park for people to come to pay to see what could possibly go wrong, right? Warning, warning. Daniel, whatever you do, don't make any sudden movements. They can sense Please your fear. Your Blue, yellow, come here. Don't, let, don't make me take out my whip. Out of here, out of here, get out of here. Out on, out you both, yellow, blue, go make green. <laughs> out, shoot, good dinosaur, good dinosaur. <laughs> Thank you, blue. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and thank you, Ranger John. <laughs> oh, well, that was fun. Um, Jurassic World Fallen Kingdom is about this group of people who wants to help the dinosaurs once again from extinction because they were all in this one island and there was about... Um, there was a volcanic eruption that was about to happen, and they were facing certain extinction, and they decided to save these dinosaurs, but then there were bad guys who wanted to sell the dinosaurs to the highest bidder as weapon and as, you know, 
exotic pet and whatnot, all right? Um, you know, the movie is a really fun movie, not just for the CGI and the actions, but the movie carries this theme that is quite profound and quite important for the life that we live today. It talks about greed. It talks about power. It talks about taming the monster within. It talks about, you know, uh, cloning and all this great stuff. But there is one theme that I want to talk about this morning that I believe is important for us, especially if you call yourself a Christian, but it's very relevant for all of us as well. So I want to talk about that. But I was, as I was preparing for this message, I thought to myself, you can't be talking about, you know, a message from a movie like Jurassic World without talking about whether dinosaurs were actually real, <laughs> right? Some of you wanted to know that question. So did dinosaurs really exist? The short answer is yes. I believe, this is my personal opinion, I believe the dinosaurs really existed. Not only did I believe the dinosaurs existed, I believe the dinosaurs existed along with human beings at some point in history. I don't believe in the evolutionist theory that the dinosaurs were, were extinct millions and millions of years ago before mankind. I believe uh, there was so many evidence that we lived together at one point. And some of you are thinking, how come then the word dinosaur is not in the Bible? Well, it's easy to explain that because the word dinosaur actually comes from a two combined Greek word, dinos and sauros. Literally, it means terrible lizard. Do you know that? You learned something new at church today. It was first coined in 1842 by Sir Richard Owen. 1842. And our first English Bible, the King James Version, was published in 1611. That means 200 years before the word dinosaur was even invented, right? So just because the word dinosaur is not in the Bible, it doesn't mean they're not real. You know, guess what? Sharks, kangaroos, <laughs> jellyfish, cats, they're also not in the Bible. But we know they exist, right? No cats in the Bible, so you cat people change to dogs. Okay. <laughs> Just kidding, just kidding. So, just because they're not mentioned in the Bible doesn't mean these animals are not real. And same goes with dinosaurs. Even though the word does not appear in our Bible, do you know what word appears in our Bible? Word like behemoth. Word like leviathan. Word like dragon. Do you know the word dragon is used 21 times in the Old Testament alone? 21 times. And they were not used in a figurative, poetic kind of sense. They were used in like a literal sense, like these animals were, were real. Perhaps because the word dinosaur was not discovered until later, was not coined until later, maybe, and a lot of scientists believe this now too, dragon was the word that we used before there was such a word as dinosaur. So dragon actually refers to dinosaur. I want to show you a clip that talks about how this idea of the existence of dragon or dinosaur is prevalent in all culture. That means at one point, they used to live among us because otherwise, how would this different culture, whether in Africa, Asia, Australia, how do they know about the existence of these animals if they didn't at one point live with them? So let's see this short clip and then I'll come back again. Dragon legend is absolutely a phenomenon. Um, there are literally too many legends to count. They're in every tribe and nation, every people group, and uh, you have them in China, Australia, Africa, Europe, North America, and South America, everywhere people inhabit. If we're to believe that they're mythological, that really presents a logical problem for us because there is a consistency that happens throughout all the dragon legends. Of course, dragon legends can become sensational. You know, a lot of your pagan religions attach some sort of meaning to these things. Like a, a lot of times in Chinese mythology, a dragon would, you know, be responsible for the tides or, uh, or it would control the water or something like that. But if you scrape away all the sensationalism, you actually have a very real creature at the bottom of them that is consistent throughout all really in the entire world. You know, the, the dragon legends, uh, the, the stories of these dragons, they always talk about these huge reptilian beasts with fierce teeth and, and prickly spines, and, and uh, they just sound so much like dinosaur. 
It's quite remarkable that, uh, to, to many people, that Australian Aboriginal people actually have uh, accounts of their ancestors having encountered creatures that today, by any reckoning, you'd describe as being dinosaurs on the basis of scientist reconstructions from fossils. Uh, on a personal level, I recall meeting a, a university researcher in the Northern Territory in Darwin after giving a, a presentation there a couple of years ago. And she said that she'd been working with the local Larrakia Aboriginal people. And they um, had a word for a fierce creature that lived in the local swamps there that used to terrorise um, the um, first Aboriginal people who'd come to that area via canoes from another country far away. And when this university researcher said to them, oh, that word obviously means crocodile, the Larrakia people responded, no, we've got a different word for crocodile. Uh, this other creature, in fact, looks very similar to some of your dinosaurs in your children's book about dinosaurs. Isn't that interesting? So there are so many evidences, so many uh, proof out there that Dinosaurs at one point coexisted with us humans. Uh, how do you explain the cave drawings? How do you explain the, the stones, the, the figurines? The, and then they discovered also human footprints together, together with dinosaur tracks. Uh, and people, the evolutionists who think that fossilization takes a long time, actually, you know, new research has found that sometimes it doesn't take that long. There's such thing as a rapid forma formation of fossils, and also this discovered soft tissue, um, you know, found in dinosaur bone and so on. So the, all this evidence proves that at one point, these creatures actually existed among us. I want to show you one example, which is remarkable. This is, um, these stones were discovered in 1930s. 11,000 of them have been found with accurate pictures of dinosaurs. Look at this, this photo right here. This is like a triceratops. You know, how did they know? This is way, way before the, the word dinosaur was even discovered. And uh, this is just, again, one uh, fantastic proof. If you're wondering, like, how can large animals like that live together with human beings? Well, do you know that a lot of dinosaurs are actually really small? They're not that big. Only, you know, a few different types of dinosaurs are, are big. But even the biggest dinosaur of all, the Argentinosaurus, they're not as big as one animal that still lives among us today, which is the blue whale. You know how big the blue whale is? It's over 200 tons. You know, the biggest dinosaur is tiny compared to the blue whale that still lives among, among us. Even sperm whale is bigger than dinosaurs. So, you know, and elephants also is, is, is actually bigger than most dinosaurs. Uh, and elephants obviously still live among us today. So... Um, you know, you can actually do more research on this if you want to, uh, creationresearch.com, probe.org. There's so many different sites for you to learn from. I'm not going to spend too much time on this because, as I said, I want to tackle this one important thread that I see happening throughout the Jurassic World movie. But let me want, give you one verse in the Bible that talks about this dinosaur, this monster. This is Job. Job is the oldest book written in our Old Testament. It's not the book of Genesis. The book of Genesis talk about creation, but the book of Job was actually the oldest manuscript, the oldest book in our Old Testament. This is what God says to Job as he was arguing, discussing with Job. God says this, look at behemoth. I want you to pay attention. God is actually telling Job to look at this animal. That means what? This animal exists together with Job. Look at behemoth. Pay attention which I made along with you, and which feeds on grass like an ox, what strength it has in its loins, what power in the muscles of its belly, its tail sways like a cedar. A lot of people think, oh, maybe it's referring to hippopotamus or, or elephant, but hippopotamus, elephant, they don't have tails like cedar. You know how tall cedar is? It's really big. Uh, the sinews of its ties are close knit. its bones are tubes of bronze, its limbs like rods of iron. It seems like it's talking about Brachiosaurus. I know my dinosaur from Jaden, you know, uh, expert in, in dinosaurs. But, you know, it looks like it's talking about a certain type of dinosaur. And um, it's, yeah, I believe, I'm just going to leave it at that. 
as I said before, if you want to do more research on it, uh, please do so. But there is one important thing that I believe we can learn from these Jurassic movies. And to set it up, I want to show you a clip about this argument that happened between the scientists of the Jurassic world with his boss, whether or not they should continue doing what they do. So let's watch this. You know that I'm not at liberty to reveal the asset's genetic makeup. Modified animals are known to be unpredictable. Just kill people, Henry. That's unfortunate. What purpose could we have for a dinosaur that can camouflage? Cuttlefish genes were added to help her withstand an accelerated growth rate. Cuttlefish have chromatophores that allow the skin to change color. It hid from thermal technology. Really? How is that possible? Tree frogs can modulate their infrared output. We use strands from their DNA to adapt her to a tropical climate, but I never imagined... Who authorized you to do this? You did. Bigger. Scarier. Um, cooler, I believe, is the word that you used in your memo. You cannot have an animal with exaggerated predator features without the corresponding behavioral traits. What you're doing here, what you have done. The board will shut down this park, seize your work, everything you've built. And Hammond won't be there to protect you this time. All of this exists because of me. If I don't innovate, somebody else will. You are to cease all activities here immediately. You are acting like we are engaged in some kind of mad science. But we are doing what we have done from the beginning. Nothing in Jurassic World is natural. We have always filled gaps in the genome with the DNA of other animals. And if their genetic code was pure, many of them would look quite different. But you didn't ask for reality. You asked for more teeth. I never asked for a monster. Monster is a relative term. To a canary, a cat is a monster. We're just used to being the cat. That is so cool. To a canary, a cat is a monster. We're just so used to being the cat. I know this movie is fiction because you can't have an Asian scientist and be a bad person. That doesn't happen. <laughs> Dr. Wu, man, come on. <laughs> But um, it's funny that this is the fifth installment in the movie, and the argument still continues. The argument that was started by this character in the movie that made a cameo, actually. His name is Dr. Ian Malcolm, played by Jeff, Jeff Goblin. And Jeff Goblin, in the very first Jurassic movie, said this, and this is very profound, and this is where I'm going to spend the rest of my time on. Okay, this is what Dr. Ian Malcolm says. Your scientists are so preoccupied with whether or not they could, they never stop to think whether or not they should. Remember Dr. Wu said, if I didn't do it, somebody else will. You know? So they want to prove themselves that they can do it. But Dr. Malcolm said, you're asking the wrong question. The, the right question is not whether or not you could. The right question is whether or not you should. I'm sure every single one of us have asked that question before. What, uh, can I do this? Can I fill in the blank? We want to know what's the bare minimum for us to do. We want to know what we can get away with, right? And as a Christian, um, I've been asked this question before, and I'm sure you've asked this question before yourself, or people ask you this question before. Can a Christian fill in the blank? Can a Christian get a tattoo? Can a Christian stay together before married? Can a Christian date a non-Christian? Can a Christian drink? Can a Christian this? Can a Christian that? And if you listen to the message of the movie from the Jurassic series, you know that that is not necessarily the best question to ask. The better question to ask is not, can I? But the better question to ask, whoever you are, is, should I? All right, should I? Uh, this is what we, we call, in theology, we call this the theology of Christian liberty. As a Christian, we believe we have been freed by Jesus Christ. 
You know, that's the privilege of becoming a Christian. Let me tell you, if you're not a Christian here this morning, there's a lot of advantages of being a Christian. Christians are free from the law of Moses. You know, there's no one person in this world that could fulfill all the laws. The laws were there not to make us better. The laws were there to expose us uh, to our limitation and imperfection so that we know that we're not perfect. Christians are free from the bondage of sin. We are free from the condemnation of sin, and that's fantastic. Not only are we free from the condemnation, the penalty of sin, but do you know that through Christ's death, you have been freed from the slavery of sin as well, from the bondage of sin. In the past, you know, you cannot not sin. There's no perfect person in the world. But now that you have been redeemed, you have an option. You are not under the bondage of sin and its power anymore. You are also free from the power of evil spirit that are in this, in this world. I know living in the first world country like Australia, we don't really believe in evil spirits. But if you go to South America, you go to Asia, you go to Africa, everyone believes in the evil spirit. And some people are scared, like, you know, I don't, I don't know how to deal with these evil spirits. But as a Christian, we have been freed from the power of evil spirit because guess what? The spirit in you is greater than the spirits that are in the world. And that, that's the reason why I don't believe a Christian can be demon-possessed. I don't believe that one bit. Why? Because the spirit in you is greater than the spirits that are in the world. You can be demon-influenced, but you can never be demon-possessed because of the Holy Spirit. So there's a lot of advantages in being a Christian. Uh, and this is a powerful, powerful theology, powerful doctrine, and it's true. We have been set free. But the question is, how do we use our freedom? And Paul addressed this issue to a group of Christians in a city called Corinth back in the day. 2,000 years ago. And the city of Corinth, if you don't know, any, you know anything about it, it's like New York, Tokyo, Singapore, and Paris combined. It's like the center for everything, for culture, for entertainment, uh, for, for religion, and everything, all right? And, and uh, Paul preached the gospel in that area, and there were a lot of converts, and Paul is writing to them how they should behave in this culture that they live in how they, use, they should use their freedom. And this is what Paul said. In 1 Corinthians 10, verse 23, 24, Paul is quoting them because Paul is teaching them the Christian liberty theology. You are free in Christ. So these people quote what Paul said to them back to Paul. And they said, I have the right to do anything, you say. And Paul said, yep, you are absolutely right. I'm not going to correct you on that because you are right. You have the right to do anything. But... Not everything is beneficial. I have the right to do anything, you say, but not everything is constructive. No one should seek their own good, but the good of others. So Paul gave us a very simple principle, how you should navigate through life in regard to your Christian freedom. Paul says, don't ask, can I? Ask, should I? Number one, is it beneficial? To you, is it beneficial, right? You can buy that car, sure, but is it beneficial in light of what you want to achieve in the future financially? Maybe you want to own a house. In light of your financial situation right now, you know, is it a wise decision? Is it beneficial to you? But Paul is not even talking about this word in that sense. When I read the original word, the original language, the word beneficial here is used more in a communal sense. Does it benefit people around you? Is it constructive? Is it building people up instead of tearing people down? Yes, you have the freedom, but how do you use your freedom? No one should seek their own good, but the good of others. So as a Christian, uh, we live in this tension, right? We live in this tension, and we need to learn as followers of Christ to manage this tension between freedom and restraint. Between freedom and restraint. Yes, we have been freed, but Paul says, I want you to exercise freedom because life is not just about you. It's about others around you as well. And as Christians, we tend to swing the pendulum one or the other. You've seen Christians who just emphasize on freedom so much. They say, oh yeah, I'm free in Christ. I can do whatever I want. You know, they just emphasize on the freedom without restraint. On the other hand, there are people, there are Christians who are just so caught up with rules and regulation and restraint, restraint, restraint. There's no joy in their lives. 
there's no freedom, there's condemnation, you know, and not only that, but they start judging other people who don't have the same restraints as they do, you know, they become very judgmental, you know, and that's not how you should live your life either. So don't swing the pendulum one way or the other. Instead, Paul says, you need to learn to manage this tension between freedom and restraint. One of the most famous football, football coaches in America is the guy by the name of Tom Landry. He used to be the coach of the Dallas Cowboys. And I'm a Cowboy supporter because I used to live in Dallas. And this is what he said. He's a great leader. Most successful football players are free to perform at their best only when they know what the expectations are, where the limits stand. I see this as a biblical principle that also applies to life. A principle our society as a whole has forgotten, and this is the principle. You can't enjoy true freedom without limits. You can't enjoy true freedom without limits. The reason why we enjoy our freedom here in Australia is because there are limits. Do you know that? If you think driving in Perth is bad, wait till you drive in Bangkok <laughs> or Jakarta or Sri Lanka, you know or the Philippines, Manila, you know, uh, where three-lane highway become five lanes, you know. Uh, people don't obey the laws. The reason why, you know, as bad as you think Perth, Perth drivers are, man, I'm telling you, this is heaven for driving in this country. Because why? Generally, people obey the law. Can you imagine if people start running through red lights, if people start to disregard all the laws of the land, this is going to be chaos. In this country, you can only enjoy true freedom um, uh, when you put limits, all right? And same thing with your Christian freedom as well. So Paul used this principle and he applies it to one really practical problem in the city of Corinth, and that is food offered to idols. I know we don't have that problem in Australia, so maybe you think like, oh, what's the relevance of food offered to idols? I know some of you from the Asian backgrounds. Some of you come from a culture or a religion where you actually sacrifice food to the idols, to the ancestors. And Paul addressed this very issue, and he says, okay, this is how you should apply this managing of tension between freedom and restraint, okay? Paul says, if someone who isn't a believer asks you home for dinner, accept the invitation if you want to. Eat whatever is offered to you without raising questions of conscience. That means, like, whatever. Paul says, eat. It doesn't matter if the food has been offered to idols, it's been prayed for, whatever. Paul says, it's not what you eat that makes you defile. It's what comes from your mouth. That's what Jesus says, right? You know, God's not going to judge you based on your diet. God's going to judge you from what's that come from your mouth. So that's the freedom portion, verse 27. This is how you exercise freedom. Yeah, you have the freedom, Paul says. You can do whatever you want. But in verse 28, immediately he says, but sometimes, sometimes there's a place for you to exercise restraints. But suppose someone tells you, this meat was offered to an idol, and then Paul said, don't eat it out of consideration for the conscience of the one who told you, not your own conscience. I know your conscience says it's all right, but I don't want you to think only about yourself. I want you to think about others. See, a lot of people, I know you heard this kind of message before, and people think, oh, don't offend your weaker brother in Christ. I think a lot of people are so concerned with the Christians think of them, they stop to consider what the non-Christians, the non-believing friends of yours think about your actions about your words, all right? Yes, Paul talked about not offending our weaker brothers or sisters. But here in this context, Paul says, hey, you know what? This is, this is unbelievers who invite them to dinner. So Paul says, think about them. Think about the non-Christians. Don't just think about yourself. And then Paul concluded it this way in verse 31. So whether you eat or drink, whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. Don't give offense to Jews, Gentiles, or the church of God. I too try to please everyone in everything I do. I don't just do what is best for me. I do what is best for others. And the last line is important. Christians especially. Pay attention. I do what is best for others so that what? That's a purpose statement. So that is a purpose statement. Why do Paul try to, you know, be considerate of others so that many may be safe. You know why we do what we do here at church? 
You know why we put this lighting, this big projector? You know why we do at the movie series? It's not just for us. It's not just, you know, for entertainment purpose. But we want to deliver the timeless truth of God's Word in a way that will communicate to people because we are thinking about them. We're not thinking about ourselves. If it's all up to me, I love to study more in depth in Greek and Hebrew. I love to take you to my class and just teach you the Bible, you know, from the original. I love doing that. But that's not going to reach anyone. You know what I'm talking about, right? So Christians, you have the freedom. This is the bottom line. Christians are free to do whatever they want, yeah? But you're not free to do whatever you want. You are free in order to serve others better. You're free in order to serve others better. That's what Christ came to this world for. You know, God exercised restraint when He saw His Son being nailed on that cross. You think God doesn't have the freedom to just, you know, obliterate all those Roman soldiers with just one word? (laughs) You don't think God has the power to rescue Jesus from from that cross if He wanted to? Man, I can't imagine the kind of restraint God put on Himself so that you and I can be saved. Because without the shedding of blood, there can be no forgiveness of sin. That's what the Bible says, right? The kind of restraint that God put, even though He has all the power in the world. You know, the kind of restraint that Jesus put on Himself. He who in the form is God, He did not consider his equality with God as something to be grasped. But what did Jesus Christ do? He emptied himself, took on a form of a servant, even died on the cross for the forgiveness of sins. So here's how we can make it even simpler, all right? Give the best for our guests. We should make it a slogan in our church. Give the best for our guests. That means when you come outside after this for coffee, you know, you have these broken biscuits. You take the broken ones, Christians, you know. <laughs> Leave the good ones for our guests, all right? You know? That means when you find parking in the church, if you call this church home, try, try to find the, the furthest parking so that our guests can have the, the best parking. Yeah. Why can't we do that? Right. right? It's all about restraint. Yeah, you have the freedom. You can park wherever you want. Except the senior pastor parking spot, don't park there. (laughs) Nah, there's no such spot. There's no such spot. (laughs) Give the best for our guests. Because God, through Jesus Christ, has given His best to you. You are free to do whatever you want. Yes, Christ has set us free. But don't take that freedom for granted. Don't take that freedom to just bring pleasure to yourself. Think about the others. Think about the people you're trying to reach because Jesus loves them. Jesus loves them so much. You may be the only gospel that they will ever read. All right? Why don't you stand on your feet? We're going to close our meeting. If you need any prayer for whatever reason, come forward. Our prayer leaders would love to pray with you and for you. You know, you don't have to carry your burden alone. Uh, That's what this faith community is for. And come back next week, because next week we're going to talk about some, again, uh, another great movie, The Avengers. And there's going to be a surprise next week as well. So please uh, make sure you come. I think we're going to serve popcorns. Is that right, John? Where is John? Ranger John. Um, What is that? He's off with the dinosaurs. He's off with the dinosaurs, playing with the dinosaurs. All right. But uh, yeah, make sure you invite your friends to come next week. We're going to talk about another great movie. It's going to be great, all right? So let's get dismissed and receive God's blessing. Father God, we thank you for today. We thank you for your word. We thank you, Lord, for the timeless truth that we can learn from your word over 2,000 years ago as to how we should exercise our freedom in Christ. Thank you, God, that you, you exercise restraint for our sake. Thank you that you did not consider our sins against us, but you put it all on your son, Jesus Christ, so that we could be forgiven. Thank you so much, God. I pray that every person here in this room will know how much you love them. 
You love them so much, God. And dismiss us today with your blessings. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, our Heavenly Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you wherever you go. May you enjoy your freedom in Christ, but may you exercise restraint so that more and more people will know Him as their Lord and as their Savior as well. God bless your family. God bless your work. God bless your children, your grandchildren. God bless your health. God bless everything that you do so that through you, people around you will be blessed and God's name will be glorified now and forevermore. All God's people who are blessed. Stay together with me. Amen. God bless you, everybody.